<laughs> yes, so this, I wasn't sure how do you celebrate uh, PCP Fest. Uh, I thought maybe uh, you light a uh, Hanukkah with three randomly selected candles. And, <laughs> And uh, as I said in my abstract, uh, there is a disclaimer, there is, uh, you know, uh, part of this talk are things that are probably false, and part of this talk are interesting results, and then they're probably not mine, so uh, you'll probably figure out which one is which. And, and so uh, I actually was an undergraduate student here at uh, Tel Aviv University, and and one of the things I, I took uh, in Tel Aviv, I, I took uh, algorithms, uh, algorithms of Mivnei Netunim and Sibuchiyut, uh, complexity. And uh, we learned algorithms from CRLS and uh, complexity from Christos's book. And, and in algorithms, we learned that uh, the, much of the course was, you know, we're given a problem, you think of a clever idea, then you've come up with an algorithm. In complexity, much of the course was you're given a, a, a problem, you think of a clever idea, and um, you come up with a reduction. And, this, uh, and every reduction or algorithm requires a new idea. And this hasn't really changed. This is, uh, for example, from my own course, uh, uh, one of the students uh, drew a doodle uh, uh, describing how uh, reductions work. And again, you think of an idea, and then how to uh, massage the input so you can, you can reduce it to the problem, and then, and then you uh, reduce it. So, so this is uh, the, the, the field of both algorithms. And uh, in complexity, we have all of those uh, many ideas, one for each algorithm, one for each problem, uh, to come up with an algorithm or reduction. And, this talk, this dream theorem, maybe we could merge algorithms and complexity, and maybe we, instead of many, many small ideas, we could have like one big idea. And why would we think something like that could, uh, could happen? So there are some running themes. Uh, so uh, things that uh, these ideas not, are not all these algorithms and reductions are not all kind of completely divorced from one another. So in algorithms, we see these uh, certain techniques come up, uh, up again and again. So uh, linear and semi-definite programming. We see uh, the greedy algorithm, local search. And uh, we see uh, randomized algorithm and randomized assignment. Uh, in, the, in reductions, again, the same techniques kind of come up again and again uh, in the context of approximation. Then we see uh, the, uh, even for exact uh, reductions, uh, we see these gadgets. Uh, for PCPs, we usually call them inner PCP, and then we have these uh, outer PCPs. Uh, and, and these kind of uh, the same ideas come up again and again. So, uh, for example, uh, in uh, one problem where we kind of understand now fairly well uh, its worst case complexity is uh, 3SAT. So uh, we have a trivial uh, 7 over 8 approximation algorithm, which is basically just choose an assignment at random. And it's a little bit less trivial if, you, if some of the clauses might have more than, uh, less than three uh, literals, but let's ignore that. And if we assume the exponential time hypothesis, this algorithm is tight. You cannot do better than a 7 over 8 approximation. And, uh, and one way, uh, and, and this is uh, based on a lot of work in the PCP theorem, but in particular this statement is from Razen Moshkovitz. And, um, and one way to think about it is to, to think of the following figure. So uh, uh, look at the approxi uh, approximation, the running time as a function of the approximation ratio. So I'll sketch the running time on a log-log scale so that a zero corresponds to polynomial time, and one corresponds to two to the n time, and say half corresponds to two to the square root n time. And, and, and basically, the, the, the way this graph looks like is that up to seven over eight approximation, uh, up to seven over eight approximation uh, we can do it uh, in a polynomial time. And then uh, if you want above seven over eight, it jumps to exponential time. And for these kind of problems, it's often useful to even think of uh, not just approximation ratio, but these uh, uh, two-dimensional planes of like, completeness and soundness. So we have, uh, so the, the problem is to say, distinguish between, say, a three-set instance that 
has a value, say, 0 0.85 versus 0 .0 0 0.6, so that would correspond to this point. And, um, and generally, uh, if, we, so we, we, if we decrease the soundness, so we make the gap between completeness and soundness bigger, it becomes an easier. If we increase completeness, the problem becomes easier. And, and some of this is the, the hard uh, corner of the, so, uh, so if we look at this plane, then here uh, we can solve this problem for this range of parameters. We can solve it in polynomial time, and here we, we require exponential time. And free set is not the only problem that we can completely understand. So uh, for example, uh, 3XO, we also have a complete understanding of uh, when we can solve the problem in polynomial time and when it requires exponential time. And there are uh, a lot more problems where we have this kind of complete understanding of what's the running time as a function of the quality of approximation. So, so given this, maybe uh, this talk, and, and now why do we need to dream? Maybe we have achieved everything we want to. So, uh, you know, uh, are we there yet? So, uh, and this is what Google Images gives me when I search for, uh, <laughs> are we there yet? Uh, so, uh, so what's missing? So, first of all, it's not true for all of these problems that we can plot this graph. So there are many problems where we have a gap between uh, the hardness and the algorithm. And this is uh, in particular true if the algorithm itself uh, is non-trivial. So often, if the algorithm is just choose an assignment at random, we can often uh, prove that it's the best. If the algorithm actually does something clever, then it's much hard for, harder for us to uh, show that it is the best. And another thing which seems maybe uh, not, like not a technical requirement, but somehow I don't like it, is that we seem to require a completely different uh, proof to show that the, to, uh, a completely different proof for the hardness part and the algorithms part. If, uh, if there is a true underlying cause for the inherent complexity of a problem, what you would like is that the same proof will give you, uh, the, the same proof will give you both the hardness and, uh, uh, and the easiness. So, uh, so I don't like the fact that it seems to require completely different techniques sometimes to show that the problem is easy and, uh, and to show that it's hard. And another thing is that for some problems, uh, we, we, our whole theory is based on worst case complexity and it's for, uh, often we, we want to understand beyond worst case complexity. And, um, and it might seem like this is too much to ask for PCPs, but I think that there is, uh, it's not completely ridiculous. So, okay, so today's talk, of the, my focus will be on optimization problems. So, an uh, optimization problem, I think of you maximize, uh, so the problem pi and the instance, uh, so the, the problem is pi, the instance is phi, and, uh, and this instance the, the, the determines an optimization problem where you want to maximize over all possible assignments some, some objective function, uh, which is the value of this assignment uh, uh, as determined by the instance. So x is the assignment. And, and this is an I'll normalize thing, so this will be between zero and one, not super important. And lots and lots of problems are, of course, optimization problems. So examples are constraint satisfaction problems, or, you know, two sat, three sat, graph coloring, uh, maximum cut, all of those are uh, constraint satisfaction problems. So uh, there the instance, uh, you know, in, in two sat, the instance uh, is a formula and uh, x is an assignment. In coloring, x would be a coloring, and uh, the instance would be a graph, et cetera. In dependent sets, sparse scatter optimization, linear programming, uh, integer programming, uh, problems uh, arising from, uh, you know, uh, like eigenvalues, uh, tensor problems, uh, problems arising from quantum information theory or uh, machine learning, et cetera. And, uh, and typically, in these cases, uh, we'll, we'll typically think of the, this value is a polynomial, or sometimes you want to scale things uh, so that it's log of a polynomial, and x is in zero, uh, say, zero, one, and, uh, or maybe sometimes you want to say it's in the sphere or some other variety, uh, nice variety of uh, Rn. Now, for the mo most of this talk, just pick what, whichever one of these problems is your favorite and think that this is what the problem I'm talking about. So I'm just... And uh, so the, the, 
I'll, I'll focus on the gap version. So what is the gap version? So we have some parameters, uh, S and C. S is smaller than C. And we want to distinguish between the case that, uh, so the, if the instance is phi, we want to distinguish between the case that the v uh, value of phi uh, is smaller than S and the case that it is at least C. And uh, the way we can think about it is that uh, the first case, I'll call it the null case, also sometimes it's called uh, the soundness case, or sometimes it's called the no instance. So it's the case where for every possible assignment uh, over uh, the input, the, the, the value is small. And the, the second case, uh, sometimes it's known as the yes case, or the uh, completest case, I'll call it the planted case, is where there is some uh, assignment x that has a high value. Okay, so uh, in the first uh, case, every possible assignment has value at most s. And in the second case, the instance uh, defines this landscape where some value has value at least c. So let's start with complexity. Uh, so what would be a dream PCP theorem? So if we have this gap problem, what we, I would like to do is to have a dream theorem which would say for every problem, maybe satisfying some conditions, maybe it has to be defined by some low degree polynomial or something like that. Uh, and every pair of parameters S and C, we can completely determine the running time. But, but, uh, what I mean by completely determine the running time is determine this exponent, uh, uh, determine this, uh, whether the running time is two to the n to the alpha, determine exactly what is this alpha that uh, achieves these values. And so in a, another way to plot whatever the graph looks like, to plot like, the graph of uh, running time versus quality of approximation. And maybe it will look like this, or maybe it will look like this, or maybe it will look something else, but uh, to, be, uh, to be able to plot it. And the reason in this dream theorem I assume that you'll have like some uh, fudge factors, a little bit of noise, is that I want to kill uh, Gaussian elimination and uh, so remove uh, brittle algorithms like uh, Gaussian elimination that without removing them, you could not hope for this uh, kind of theorem. So, so alpha equals zero means polynomial? Yes, for me, like right now, let's say, uh, alpha equals zero, uh, for me right now, let's say it's polynomial, although... Uh, it's not by the definition. It's not by the definition, yes. Uh, you could ask, uh, yeah, right now, let's say that I, I would be very happy to plot this graph. And then if you plot it, you can look at the plane of like alpha equals zero and ask, is this, is this polynomial or is this merely two to the n to the little of one, uh, I don't know, two to the two to the square root log n. But, uh, but I, would, uh, I would be very happy to try to, to plot this, uh, this graph. And let's, let's understand one case where we don't know how to plot this graph. This is the case of unique games. So a priori, if you look at a uh, problem in the unique games, and again, you don't have to know exactly what is unique games uh, for this, uh, just that it's some approximation problem. It's like Avi said in his talk, it's uh, linear equations where every equation uh, over a finite field where every equation only involves two variables. So uh, a priori, you would guess that maybe it looks like three sat. That uh, it will, uh, basically there would be some region where it's polynomial and some region where it's two to the n. And the only question is whether the unique games conjecture is true or UGC is true or false. And if it is true, then this region where it's polynomial shrinks as the alphabet uh, grows. And if it is false, then this region you know, has some size, significant size that doesn't shrink as the alphabet grows. So this would be a priori the guess for how this plot would look for the, for, uh, the unique games problem. And uh, we don't know how to draw the plot for the unique games problem, but we already know that this guess is wrong. So uh, in my work with uh, our story, we gave a sub-exponential time algorithm which showed that if the unique games conjecture is true, this is not the shape of it. It cannot look like, uh, it cannot look like this because there's definitely some areas here where it's at most, say, half. So uh, it cannot look like this. And uh, this very new and exciting work of, uh, of uh, Do, Muli, and, and Subash Kot and building on, uh, on this uh, uh, work with um, uh, also Guy and uh, Irit, uh, show that this picture is also cannot be true. So uh, there, there will be some regimes here where this is, uh, say, at least, uh, yeah, the, the, where this is at least, uh, say, a quarter. 
And combining both these things, we know now that the, the real picture is going to be a, a soft transition. So the, the real picture is going to be, there are going to be areas in this graph which maybe makes sense why I'm plotting these graphs rather than saying there is only a 2 to the n and a polynomial regime, where, where the exponent is strictly between 0 and 1. But the, uh, but the shape of the exact graph, we still don't know. And they say if the unique games conjecture is true, then, then the, this plane here uh, has, uh, where it runs in polynomial time uh, shrinks. Well, if the unique the, the conjecture is true, when this plane is, uh, has a, like a fixed size that doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, shrink. And one thing that um, I should uh, emphasize is that even if we know the unique games conjecture, it will only characterize for us the, uh, this bottom plateau, this bottom plane. It will not tell us, like, so even if we prove the unique game conjecture, the only thing it will tell us is uh, where, is this uh, where is this boundary go, where is this line. It will not tell us what is the exponent here. It will not tell us, tell us what is uh, the boundary of this uh, plateau above. So the unique games conjecture, sometimes it's thought of as the ultimate PCP. It's not the ultimate PCP. It will not, uh, it will not answer for us the, the full, uh, the, the full uh, quality versus uh, time uh, trade-off. So I, I view the unique games conjecture as uh, it would be eventually a special case of a dream PCP theorem that will be much bigger. And yeah, so we want more. OK, so now let's talk about algorithms. What? Yes. What? No, we've assumed the exponential time. Yes. Right. So unique games conjecture will give will, unique games conjecture. If you prove, you will probably pr give some kind of a lower bound. But uh, it seems, in, 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 if you prove the UGC, it seems uh, inherently uh, unable to characterize the top plateau because the unique games problem itself uh, has a, a sub exponential time algorithm. So, uh, so, so if you prove the unique games conjecture, it's, uh, it, it, it seems inherently uh, the proof itself will probably give some kind of uh, low bound here, but it seems inherently unable to characterize this, this in full. All the way up, yes. But then, then that would be like a bigger thing. That, uh, maybe what I'm saying is, as a black box, if you prove the UGC, it, uh, as a black box, if you prove the UGC, it will only, uh, the UGC itself as a black box only gives you that. If you, you proof could well be uh, a bigger PCP theorem that uh, characterizes this entire thing and also as a special case, improve, prove the, the, the UG. So, so this is, uh, yeah. so, uh, so I don't know chronologically what will happen, but, uh, uh, but what I'm saying is that the unique games conjecture as, as a conjecture by itself is not enough to be, uh, uh, is not enough to uh, give a full characterization. And it could be that the right way to prove the unique games conjecture or disprove is to, uh, to, to get like the, to, to aim for getting the full plot and as a corollary obtain that. OK, so uh, algorithms. So let me give you uh, think of one problem uh, as a, a problem to think about. And again, just uh, like an example problem, uh, the planted click. So in the planted click, we want to distinguish between a random graph and a graph with a, a k click. Uh, so in this problem, the instance is a graph. The value uh, is the, an x. X, uh, you can think of it as a, an indicator vector for a set of size k. And the, uh, and the value uh, is the number, of edge, uh, the number of edges that are contained uh, divided by the num maximum number of edges. So value of 1 is a click, and uh, value 0 is independent set. So in the null case, uh, it's a random graph. Uh, and in the planted case, we, put, we, we pick some x uh, star and put a click there. So in the null case, most, um, basically almost all sets have about half of the edges inside them. And in the planted case, we have one uh, that has uh, all the edges, 
all the edges inside it. What, what is case right now? It's a parameter. So, so in the planted click, there are two. <laughs> this goes exactly to Benny's question. There are two regimes uh, of uh, these planted instances. So one is when k is much smaller than square root n, and then uh, uh, the graph looks kind of like this. Most of the, if k is much smaller than square root n by kind of birthday considerations, most of the sets are disjoint from x star. And in some sense, you can think of like basically uh, try, uh, finding x star is a little bit like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, it, uh, because it's really, mo uh, most sets have nothing to do with the click, so they are look like they are like in the random graph. In the l case where k is larger than square root n, then most cases intersect x star, so somehow the effect, the planting this x star will have like an impact uh, which kind of spreads out across the search space. And in, in, indeed, you can often show that various type of local improvement algorithms will start somewhere here and start climbing and eventually will find this X star. So, uh, so these are, uh, in the left are the kind of hard instances where it's very hard to find uh, this X star. In the right are the easy uh, instances. And in the, if you look at the hard case, so, so, so the hard case is really when the X star like, is uh, this kind of needle in a haystack that most, if you pick a different set, most likely it has nothing to do with this X star. And another way to, to look at it is that because of this, if you planted more than one click, you could still, uh, you could, you could still do it and they would be kind of farther away, far away from each other um, in this uh, landscape of instances. And in some sense, what it means is that they, uh, they form kind of error correcting code. Or uh, statistical physicists like to say that there would be like some energy barrier if you want to move from one cl planted click to the other planted click. So, so another way to think of a, of a hard instance of these kind of problems is where, where it would be possible to have not just even one solution, but many solutions that have nothing to do with each other. And uh, even if I gave you one, you would not be able to find any of, of the others because uh, traveling from one to the other uh, is hard. So in some sense, our lesson is that if you have hard instances, then uh, not all instances that are hard have this property, but, uh, but if, if you have a hard regime, maybe I should have said, then it's possible to create an instance where the solution forms a code. And the harder the instance, the higher the rate of this code. Because that means it's kind of like the, the, the smaller the radius of influence of each, uh, the, the, the more the needle is hidden in the haystack. And, and, and in, in this uh, planted version, if you have any kind of uh, assignment, any kind of set that has non-trivial uh, number of edges, there is a reason for that. And uh, the reason is it has to be related to one of those code words, one of those play, uh, solutions that you have planted. So you can think of this is the kind of hard instance, uh, one where the solutions are, uh, have a code and uh, every non-trivial uh, assignment is related to one of those. Uh, then you turn to back to you know, the situation where you're having only one peak, you similar to the situation where you have a code of peak mm -hmm. hardness. So that's uh, some of the one reason for this dream. Yes, you're anticipating like, a, uh, yes, exactly. So, uh, so, so the intuition is uh, one way to think about also is that like the log of the code side is kind of uh, is uh, well, it's the entropy of the if you take a random uh, solution, and in some sense this is the planted instance, uh, and in some sense we have this philosophy and th this part if you haven't seen pseudo distribution you just ignore these two next two lines. Uh, if you're thinking of trying to solve these problems using semi-different programming, then this would be the kind of the pseudo-entropy of the null instance, the one that has no solutions at all. Uh, so the, the instance that has no solution at all can still seem to you as if it has actually not even one, but many solutions. And, uh, and that kind of controls the number of rounds of semi-definite programming, which basically is the log of the running time. So, so more or less, we are thinking that the log of the code size is like the log of the running time to solve uh, this problem. Okay, so back to complexity. So how do we prove PCP results? So typically, uh, we want to show that uh, it's hard to approximate uh, the S versus C gap uh, problem. 
So, uh, so typically, we do it in two steps. So step one, we, uh, we start with a different problem. We look at a, a problem where there is a huge gap and uh, it's very hard to approximate. And this is known sometimes as the outer PCP, sometimes as label cover. That's not the only way to get it, but if you think you have in your mind parallel repetition, that's not a bad like, thing to think about. So, uh, so this is this gap problem. And, uh, and so you have this problem gamma, which is very hard. And sometimes you even require some prop nice properties of this uh, apart from just being hard. Uh, so this is your outer PCP. And the inner PCP is some kind of a gadget uh, that you compose with it. And then you get uh, and you use that to uh, reduce gamma to pi. So, the, uh, so what is this gadget? This gadget is uh, typically um, uh, what does it has? So it's, it's basically an instance of this problem pi. And it has to map symbols in this alphabet sigma to uh, good assignments for, uh, for this instance phi. And every, we, we, we often need some kind of a result saying that every non-trivial assignment has to be related to some, uh, some code word in this image of the map. So, so it really is a code. And intuition is basically the bigger, the, if you keep the size of the instance fixed and you increase the number of code words, so you have a higher rate, so it's a more efficient code, so it's more efficient gadget, and in some sense it's a harder instance. And uh, examples of these kind of codes uh, ordered by the rate, so like the long code has the worst rate and the short code has a better rate, these Grassmann codes have better rate than the short code, and the Hadamard has even better rate than the Grassmann. And these are uh, often the, 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 the basically, we, we try to create a situation where, in some sense, the, uh, our good assignments correspond to, to these codes. And so what would be like a dream approach for proving a PCP like that? We'll take a hard instance. We will convert it into a gadget by basically uh, do, uh, transforming uh, these kind of many solutions into a code and uh, the hardness of phi will be the efficiency of the reduction and, would be, uh, and that would kind of give us maybe a tight characterization of the running time. And there's many problems with realizing this dream and I'll spend some time on talking about these problems. Uh, one issue is that out, out of, uh, a priori the efficiency of this constant size gadget doesn't seem to have anything to do with efficiency of the global reduction. But if we could do that, then we would basically get like a tight characterization of the, the running time and be able to plot this thing. And we generally don't know how to do it. So what are the partial results? The most impressive result uh, is, uh, or I don't know if most impressive, but definitely most closely resembling this kind of thing is Raghavendra's result, which basically says this, this, this for uni, uh, UG hardness. So there he only cares about fooling it's kind of basic uh, SDP, which somehow corresponds. To, we, uh, it doesn't really care about the code, except that it has uh, any, some kind of rate. It doesn't really care about the rate, and it, it can uh, use the long code. And basically show that if the Unigames conjecture is true, you can, uh, for many problems, in particular for all constant satisfaction problems, you can basically carry out this kind of idea, where you take an instance that, uh, and, and you manage to convert it into some kind of a planted instance, and, 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 then you, uh, and, and then you use that as a gadget. And uh, there is a very interesting res result in kind of a very different uh, regime is this result of Sion Chan, where he gave uh, NP hardness for a CSP, which was kind of inspired by uh, some of Square's lower bounds. So it's kind of inspired by a hard instance, but again, it's not really a black box reduction. And, and then there is this uh, recent work, which one way to think about it, which is very non-black uh, box, but in one way to think about it, they show that if you take an instance that is more efficient, in the sense that uh, it has this covering property, which is a stronger version of efficiency, then uh, you get NP hardness rather than this unique game hardness. And, and, uh, and this is a very non-black box reduction. It also has kind of non, no graceful degradation in the sense that it knows only how to use, uh, it has this qualitative property of covering, which implies very strong efficiency. If you add mild uh, in efficiency, then you don't know how to, uh, to use it at all. 
but these are kind of some results that I view as in this general uh, flavor. So what are like what are the some of the obstacles? Why we don't have these dreams? So so there are many ones. So f but and, and some of it, uh, yeah, just some some things that are kind of just mysterious to me, and I hope that part of a dream theory will be able to resolve them. So one thing is that there seem to be some problems where we, we really ought to think beyond just easy and hard. So let's look at the example again like these unique games. And it speaks the completeness to be, so to make the graph, you know, uh, two-dimensional rather than three-dimensional, just fix the completeness to be one minus epsilon. So the, uh, our understanding of this problem looks something like that. The, uh, there is a regime where uh, th this is what we, we, our understanding of the problem. There is a regime where it's in polynomial time. And exactly when it ends depends on if the unique games conjecture is true, then we know exactly when this regime ends. Then there is a regime where it's exponential time. And then there is a, 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 a sub-exponential time. And then there is a regime where it runs in exponential time. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is that beyond just this time, the, uh, so it seems the following. So, so there is a, the regime where it's polynomial time. There is a regime where it's exponential. And this is uh, where we get uh, uh, using exponential time hypothesis. And uh, when, when random here, I don't mean uniformly random, but we can very easily create fairly natural distributions, which uh, we can easily create fairly natural distributions of instances which, which seem to require exponential time. So this regime seems hard in kind of many ways you could interpret the word hard. This regime seems easy in many ways you could interpret the word easy. In fact, often it's actually linear time and quasi-linear rather than uh, linear, uh, rather than polynomial. And then you have this intermediate thing where, first of all, Yes, so, so it's, uh, on the one hand, it's uh, super polynomial in the worst case. But on the other hand, if you actually find an instance where, uh, where it's hard, or even conjecture to be hard, pl plausibly conjecture, you could get a paper out of it. So, so it's, uh, you know, it's not just that it's not hard on the average case. It's really, really, you know, the, uh, it seems like uh, the, the hard instances are very well hidden, uh, and uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not simply that a random instance is, un is going to be easy. It actually se uh, seems like it's, if this problem is hard, it's, very, uh, it's hard in some sense on a very, very special set of inputs. So, and, and this is, seems not to be the only, uh, yeah, so, so in some sense it seems like it could also be the case that is, uh, say, that uh, if you define some notion of non-degenerate complexity, which I don't know how to define, but there might be some w something that is between uh, worst case and average case, which kind of say, you know, uh, ignore some very special structured inputs, then it could be that maybe if you ignore that, then the complexity of this problem would be very, very simple, would look like a threshold. And, uh, and this whole strange behavior is due to some very special things. So. So, I mean, the, the idea is that, you know, average case usually is with respect to some distribution. And, uh, and here it seems like for, for any natural distribution, you think of, uh, so, uh, so you can think of maybe average case with respect to any natural distribution, but I don't know how to define natural distributions. So, but it seems like uh, maybe like a little, little bit dif difference like between, say, uh, if you have a region of space of simply measure zero, and you have a region of space that is low dimensional, like you say, uh, that is smaller dimension. So it's kind of smaller than just simply being measure zero. It's really kind of uh, things that are degenerate in some sense. And so, and it seems to be not the only problem where we have this kind of interesting uh, thing. Uh, so the click problem also seems to be the case where, you know, uh, it's definitely easy to, if you want to uh, distinguish between a graph that has a, a click of size one and a click of size n. Uh, uh, it seems hard also in the average case setting if you want to, dis uh, if you want, uh, want a scrote and approximation. But in the me intermediate, yes, it's hard in the worst case, uh, but it's easy on random inputs. And again, it might be also seems like you kind of really have to work some, somehow to find the instances where, uh, that demonstrate that click is hard to, you know, enter the zero, uh, three quarters. You can f find these instances. They exist. You know, you have Fagan's theorem. You, you, you don't know that they exist. 
but they seem to be maybe, again, kind of somewhat uniquely uh, have unique property, yes. And not even if we assume like some cryptography or anything, we still don't know how to get like No, we, if we find them, we can find these instances because there is a hard, uh, hardness result. You can plug in a one-way function and uh, apply the reduction. You get these instances. So it's not like we don't know how to find these instances. It's just that they do seem to be kind of somewhat structured. And I think, for example, for, for a while it was believed that maybe square root n is the right is the right approximation because it's, it's not easy uh, to find these kind of instances. It's, uh, I'm not saying it's, unlike the unique games, it's, uh, you won't get a paper from finding an instance like that, but it's still like, uh, also be, the paper has already been written. So, um, and the shortest vector problem also has a similar thing, although I would say that it's very algebraic. I'm not sure if it, any kind of doing PCP it would fit into, but it's still like an interesting uh, thing where you have like a regime where this problem is hard, a regime where this problem is easy, and some intermediate, where uh, the problem is in NP intersect co NP and, uh, and it has this worst case to average case reduction. In this case, we do believe it's hard on the average case, but it's easy in some other ways. And it's also, uh, and so this, uh, this is uh, Aron of Regev, right? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, and, um, and, uh, it's, uh, and, 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 and this is actually also the regime where it's useful for uh, cryptography. So, so, so this is somewhat of a mystery to me, like an uh, understanding, like trying to characterize this regime. I think it's also like part of understanding, like, so even if we completely plotted the, the worst case complexity, I would still not be perfectly happy if, uh, if uh, we don't understand uh, where the worst case instances come from. Another kind of mystery to me is the following thing. So suppose we have this gadget, and um, and we have a, and it has this code of planted solutions. So so these solutions are things that have value c, and typically with this kind of instance, you have like these th three types of isoperimetric type of theorems. Uh, so one is optimality that these things, are, these planted solutions, are the best. So no solution has better value than c. The other is stability that um, if you have uh, some assignment that has almost uh, value C, then it should also be very close to one of those. This is a, a kind of results that Ronit talked about uh, yesterday. So say uh, if the code uh, is linear. And, uh, and then you have uh, this kind of inverse results where you want to say, or least decoding sometimes known, uh, where you want to say that if it has any value that's non-trivial, say a little bit larger than the S, which is kind of the baseline, in the null, then uh, it has to be related in some way to uh, one of those planted solutions. And, and, and typically, uh, this inverse theorem is what we need for uh, proving harness of approximation results. Uh, so this will kind of correspond to the soundness of the gadget that we are looking for. And one observation is, is it turns out that uh, if you have, uh, if you look at, uh, you have an inverse theorem like that, and you look at its proof, if the proof itself is algorithmic, and um, there is a formal way to the, the find algorithmic, which I'll not go into, then I I this instance actually is not a hard instance. It's an instance we can actually solve. Another observation is often these proofs are algorithmic. And we have this paper where we show that, uh, yeah, and I don't even know, for example, uh, if the very recent things, uh, your uh, results on the Grassmann graphs, if the proof is uh, algorithmic or not, but I don't see a reason why it shouldn't be. And and this is kind of like, to me, it's some kind of a cognitive dissonance. How can you use uh, an easy instance to, come, uh, to, to, use, to, to, to do a harness reduction? And there is no formal reason why you shouldn't be able to, but it just seems like strange and something I'd like to understand better. And another mystery is uh, noise. So I said like we had to have noise uh, to kind of kill Gaussian elimination, et cetera, and so it seems plausible that you know, if you add noise, then you make semi-definite programming uh, optimal. And, but, but can we prove anything like about that? And, and, and uh, is there some kind of, like, what is noise? How much noise do you sh should you choose? Is there some kind of a principled way to, sh to, ch to choose it? And one conjecture, which I think we don't know how to prove, is there is an, an, a proof system known as dynamic sum of squares, which captures also uh, which captures also Gaussian elimination. And one, something we could potentially prove is that, say, if you add noise, then dynamic is not more powerful than static. 
And if you prove this conjecture and you prove it with a particular level of noise, then that might be kind of offer you some principled way of. What is the noise you prove? What? So, uh, so a noisy problem would be where you uh, say um, you want to, uh, let's say for any two parameters, C and S, I would uh, basically be free to um, shift them by some epsilon to, uh, to look at the hardest, hardest problem within uh, when I modify C and S up to some epsilon. So, um, so if, I, uh, if I look at... Uh, so one way to think about it is that I'm not trying to, if I want to plot these uh, things, I'm ignoring measure zero. I'm, I'm ignoring uh, measure zero things. So for example, uh, if you look at uh, Gaussian elimination, uh, if you look at problems that are linear, then the value C equals one, the, the plane C equals, the line where C equals one is an easy, it's a measure zero set where the problem is easy. Now, of course, you could renormalize things so that it will become, instead of C equals one, be C equals half or something like that. But it will always be, uh, it will always be uh, kind of a measure zero. Uh, harder than just a time noise on the equation. What? Because a time noise on the equation. Yeah, if you are talking about, yeah, if you're talking about CSP, then, then it's very nice. If you're talking about CSPs, uh, I was talking about like more general thing, which might be kind of arbitrary polynomial. But if you're talking about CSPs, then adding noise would be simply, uh, say, uh, just uh, you have an instance where the, the solution is not one because you, the, your instance, you kind of randomly, uh, you, 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 you put in some random constraints that, have nothing, uh, that, don't, that are not informative about your planted solution. Right, so in some sense, I, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a weaker conjecture than say, I'm saying that other, so I'm saying, um, I'm allowing, uh, in more general, I'm saying I'm allowing you to kill things even in adversarial things. I don't think it will make a difference, but. Uh, and, uh, and another mystery to me is like this outer PCP. And what's its relation to the inner PCP? A priori, this is like a big size object, the one is a constant size object, uh, and somehow the similar ideas show up in both, and I'm not completely sure why. So typically, this outer PCP is this label covered with some graph, and uh, so it's some, some, some constraint satisfaction problems on uh, pairwise constraints, which you, you can think of as a graph. And these graphs, there are two flavors, as far as I see, you can see, the, uh, of these graphs. One of them is where it's kind of a general label cover, and this graph is kind of a, has properties that are kind of expander-like or randomish, et cetera. And these are the kind of things we can use to show exponential hardness. And then there is this thing that you guys are using, the, the smooth label cover, where, uh, like uh, Irit was saying, these graphs always have to have some kind of overlap in some sense. If you think of it, uh, um, you, you can think of this graph as somehow always coming from some kind of uh, uh, some kind of sets where uh, and, and, and edges are like two uh, edges correspond to two sets that always have to have some overlap, but this move label cover it has to have tons of overlap, like almost completely overlap. And these things typically can only uh, we know only used to establish uh, to to, uh, to the end to the one over k hardness. And, and the interesting thing is that this when when you uh, in this move label cover you, you, this Johnson uh, graph. There are various inverse theorems about it, and they might be algorithmic as far as I know. And I don't know, maybe it implies that it yields easy instances. Uh, and another kind of related question related also to establishing more difficulty, is there some kind of a de-randomized Johnson graph and maybe high, high dimensional expanders are like ways to de-randomize these kind of things and, and and maybe also more, more principled ways to think about, and, and I do think actually there are more principled ways to, like Yvit said, to think about these outer PCPs. And, and yes, so, so, so generally I, there is mo mostly I don't know, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and basically what I want to say is that I, th I think there is like a bigger theory that we, that I hope that, uh, and, and, uh, that many people have already uh, sh shown so steps towards for, and I, and I hope that we'll see, 
we'll see more of it. And, and, and like I said, most of these steps, and maybe all of these steps were done by other people and probably also uh, all will be done by other people uh, in the future. But we, we see these kind of uh, similar ideas in Hades and, uh, and algorithms, and there is the hints of general meta theorems that may be even more general than e the UGC. And, and we have the, to tackle these obstacles. And like re resolving the UGC, uh, I think, will happen, uh, and, uh, and, and, and it will be great. But uh, this will not be the, this, this is in some sense just the first step. Uh, may, maybe, maybe the way it will be resolved it will already give a lot of the other things, but, but a priori it could be just the first step to, uh, to completely characterize, and we kind of want to go uh, beyond it, and we really want to kind of have hardness and easiness flow from the same, from, from the same type of uh, proof. Uh, and in some sense, let me give kind of an historical analogy. I don't know if it's accurate or, uh, over, uh, yeah, it might be, you know, um, you go further in history, uh, it's like you look at objects uh, that are very far, they need to be bigger, so maybe I'm taking a bigger analogy that, uh, that I should. Uh, so, so if you look at solving polynomial equations in the 1400s, etc., then, then in some sense if you looked at what people did, I think it will look a lot like Stock Fox proceedings. Uh, they uh, had like... Uh, <coughs> particular polynomial equations, and then they would find a solution for it. And people published a book with, I think, 200 different types of equations, cubic and quartic, and et cetera, equations and uh, ways to solve them. And, and a lot of very smart people like uh, Lagrange and Euler and, uh, and Gauss uh, spent time like, uh, solving very particular equations. Uh, like, say, Gauss was very happy to give a solution in radicals to x to the 17 equals 1, which um, corresponds to uh, constructing a 17 gone with a uh, compass and straight edge. So people were kind of solving these equations one by one, and for every equation they had like a different clever idea of how to solve it. And then uh, came group theory, and in some sense with one kind of big idea, now there is a machine is, uh, that you, uh, that given an equation, uh, first of all we know that some equations are solvable and some are not solvable, and in some sense it became kind of completely mechanical. And of course, this is not the end of algebra. It's not as if uh, now uh, we replace mathematicians with machines, but now we have just basically a different perspective and we ask these meta questions and uh, people don't uh, spend their effort on solving a single equation. And, uh, and maybe, uh, so if you look at theoretical computer science today, then a lot of the time we, yeah, we have like some, a lot of papers that say this problem for these parameters, uh, there is an algorithm of this problem for this parameter, there is a hardness of approximation result. Uh, so we have lots of very clever ideas and lots of very smart people working on it, but maybe at some point we would be able to somehow replace this type of results with kind of a machine where it's say, you know, um, give me a description of the problem, then there is, a mechanical procedure might be very cumbersome, might be, uh, but will basically tell you what is the landscape of, uh, of this problem, what is the map of uh, parameters to running time. And, uh, and I think that would be uh, um, very nice. And, um, and, and yeah, and of course it won't be at all the end of algorithms, I think it just would be like different types of meta questions or, and again, I, uh, and probably also, even if you characterize running time of up to polynomial or sub-exponential factors, there is much more to do in, in terms of uh, actually running. Like, actually, people still today, I think, you know, uh, still work hard at actually solving equations uh, more quickly, et cetera. And that's it. <laughs>